good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the evolving role of the finance leader. My name is Paul Windsor. I'm head of industry solutions at Sempra Analytics. Uh, I'm going to be your host today. Uh, I, my previous background is uh, 20 years in the data and analytics uh, space, working for companies in data warehousing, BI and AI. And as I say, I should be hosting the, the webinar today. Now let's have a look at the uh, agenda and what we're going to be covering today. So if we bring the agenda slide up, um, I'm going to be doing some introductions uh, shortly. We're going to be discussing the involving role of the finance leader. We're going to be actually doing a poll today, so it'd be great to get your input into uh, your feelings and your experience of where your organizations are within digital transformation. We're going to be doing a fireside chat with Sam Bradshaw of Southern Co-op alongside Tom Lemon of Financial Director. We're going to be having a keynote presentation from Ken Mertzel at Automation Anywhere. And we're going to finish with some Q&A. We did ask uh, you to, to write in with some questions uh, when you registered and those questions have come in. Um, and we're going to give you the results of the poll as well. Now, first of all, uh, let me introduce you to Tom Lemon. Tom Lemon is the Senior Journalist at Financial Director. Welcome, Tom. Hi, thanks for having me. So Tom is a Senior Journalist at the Financial Director. He's written many articles on the subject of digital transformation in the Finance Department and how this is impacting the role of the finance leader. And he's here to discuss today what he is seeing in the marketplace. So we're delighted to have you join us, Tom. And I'm going to ask you to give your comments and your reflections and what you're seeing in the digital transformation in the finance function in just a minute. But before I ask you to do that, just a bit of housekeeping. This session will be on demand and available at sempraanalytics.com in the events page. Um, I have to remind you, as we all are, we're all working from home. So apologies if anything happens or a doorbell rings or uh, uh, the computer freezes. Um, as I say, we'd be love to see you contribute towards the poll shortly. We'll be answering questions at the end of the webinar, um, especially those that have been sent through before the webinar started. But please do not stop in asking questions. If you have any questions you'd like to cover, um, today. If we can't get to them, uh, we certainly will be following up with you after the event. So with that, I think we're all pretty much set up. Um, Tom, um, I've done the introduction. It would be great now if you just give us a bit of background on what you're seeing in the finance, and finance function around digital transformation, what you've been writing about, who you've been talking to, what you're seeing um, in terms of transformation. Over to you. Yeah, so, um, well, thanks for having me and let's hope I don't have any uh, technical problems or my cat has been locked out of the room, so let's hope that she doesn't make an appearance either. Um, yeah, so I, I work on financial director and across some other finance titles as well. Um, it feels sort of crazy to say, but, but I have been working for financial director for, for nearly two years now um, and mainly covering issues around digital transformation, particularly since the pandemic started. Um, I'd say the thing I've noticed really is, is that, that since the pandemic at least, that the, the penny has dropped in terms of the value of transformation. Um, you know, as we'll see in, the, um, in a survey uh, that I've been doing, um, we, we've seen that a lot of firms are, are still at the early stages of their digital transformation projects. They're not then they're still not comfortable, I'd say, from a lot of people I'm talking to. Um, but but it is getting through that it's important and it's necessary. Um, the I think one of the problems I've heard, I, I spoke to a CFO a few months ago, and they said that one of the problems for the finance team, which I'm sure everyone on this call will, will relate to, is that historically finance teams have have just got it done. They, no matter what it is, what what time they stayed up working till, they got their clothes done, they sorted out payroll or whatever it was. Um, and that has often meant that the investment in, in finance has, has been lacking because 
because the rest of the team go, well, you still get everything done. What's the problem? Um, and and now that we've had the pandemic and suddenly you can't be in the office, you can't do your manual paper processes, um, that, that has really scuppered a lot of firms and people have realized that finance has to be rerouted and has to have this sort of digital resilience looking forward. And, and obviously, because of the panic that ensued at the start, um, forecasting and the, and the tech around those sorts of things has, has become even more important. Um, and, and yeah, remote working is, has had a, had, had a massive impact on the need to remove those sort of manual tasks. You know, you, you can't go into the office. I think I, think I saw that finance, um, finance professionals were, were some of the people left behind. If, if, if an organization said 90% of our workforce is working from home, the 10% was often the finance team because they didn't have their processes set up and they, they physically couldn't do their job at home, at least at the start. But we're hoping that that, that has changed now. And, and we are starting to see that 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 feeling from people I talk to that that, that has really changed. And, and and it gives me optimism when I look at the future that the, the penny is dropped, so to speak. So almost catch up time for the finance function compared to other sort of functions within an organization such as supply chain and marketing this feels like this is now the time for a real focus around the finance leadership leaders and, and the function itself yeah it's it's not been it's not going to be ignored so so you did a survey didn't you back in october um so so i think we can bring that up on the screen as to um what the actual results were of that survey and you asked a question and you got some interesting responses back can if we yes, can, can so you just talk 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 us through this who was the audience that this went out to because what we want to do tom is give give a chance to to explain this and then we're going to actually ask the listeners to to actually uh uh actually uh, contribute towards the poll itself yeah, so we we ran um, uh, a survey on finance director like um, we, we we do quite often, um, and this this was one of the questions for, for the digital transformation. Just trying to see where people were at. So it was it was going for for our audience and and for finance leaders with people we were talking to, um, and yeah, how far have you gone in your process to digitize the finance department? Um, it. This was in October, like we say. So we are still, you know, a good six months after the, the first lockdown. And and like you say, 6% not started, 47% early stages. So after six months, we still had people in that in that right. early market, which was, I guess, quite worrying. Um, but then on the other side, you, you had six percent up to date which is great um 14 percent nearly complete and 27 percent at the halfway mark of what they perceive their journey to be um and and i think what it what it shows is is that 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 moment the penny has dropped like i said but but we're still we're still just starting it started with the pandemic and now it's and now it's moving forward. Um, it would be interesting to see today, a few months on from this. So obviously, we're now in March, um, which is again frightening. Um, but it would be interesting to see how that how that has changed for for people. Whether whether more and more people feel they're in a better place now than they were six months ago. Well, why don't we do that now? Why don't we take the opportunity while we've got the, the listeners on the webinar today to ask the same question? So uh, this is the only part that we're asking you guys on the call today to get involved. So um, if we can bring up the question um, and the chance for you guys to answer this, uh, we'd love to get your perspective. So uh, while I'm, you know, we'll, we'll give it a few seconds to give you the chance. So how far have you gone? in your process to digitize the finance department we're looking for you to select one are you up to date are you nearly complete do you feel you're halfway through digitizing your finance department 
are you at the early stages or you feel you haven't started at all? What we'd love to do is just get you to think about this for a few seconds, uh, capture your response, and then what we're going to do is we're gonna come back to that at the end of the webinar and let's see how it compares to the survey that Tom did back in October. Okay, I think that's enough time to give you the chance to think about that. So let's move on with our agenda. And what we're now gonna do is we're gonna hear from a fireside chat with Sam Bradshaw of Southern Co-op with Tom. Now, Tom, we pre-recorded this a few days ago. I think I've even noticed you've got the same shirt on from the interview, so. I promise you, it's, it's just a slightly different shade of blue. <laughs> got it, okay. But uh, this, was, this was a great conversation you guys had a few days ago. So what I wanna do is I just wanna kind of introduce Sam Bradshaw so we, we can just go straight into the conversation that you, you had with her. So let me just give you a background around Sam Bradshaw. So Sam Bradshaw is a strategic and visionary director, director with over 20 years uh, experience working in the delivery and support of business critical back office services within the UK and the EMEA organization. Now Sam is extremely experienced in the completion of many innovative and complex IT infrastructure, network and enterprise projects. Sam is very customer focused. She's always thinking about delivering very innovative change management um, transformation projects and also very much focused on improving productivity of the finance leaders and the finance functions. Now, what we're hoping you're gonna hear from this interview with Tom is how the partnership between the business and the finance has led to this successful implementation of their digital transformation and what this has meant for Southern Co-op. So without further ado, let's listen to that conversation between Sam and Tom. And when we come back, Tom, I'm gonna to ask for your reflections on what you thought. So welcome, Sam. Before we dive into the wider questions today, can we start with understanding more about the Southern Co-op business and how the business has adapted to serving your customers in the last 12 months? Yeah, hi, Tom. Yeah, no problem. Um, so the Southern Co-op uh, was established in Portsmouth, um, Hampshire about 145 years ago. Um, we we're an independent cooperative owned by its 140,000 members operating across uh, about 11 counties in the south of England. Um, our main business is food, and uh, we have a network of about 200 retail stores um, and quite a strong franchise arm included um, in that number. We also have our end of life services, and um, that includes crematorium and a, a natural uh, burial ground. Um, we, as a cooperative, we have a purpose beyond profit um, and our values and principles to support, support and sustain um, the business that we practice and committed to making difference in our local community. Um, over the last 12 months, uh, we've continued to trade. Uh, we've obviously been very focused on trading in a very safe um, environment for both our customers, our members and our colleagues. Um, and providing that sort of key service to the communities that we trade in. And, and given the, the sort of continued adaptability and agility that you need today in an organization like Southern Car, does, does finance get a big enough voice in developing strategies for, for future growth? Absolutely, uh, you know, our business continues to trade in a very fiercely competitive environment. Um, that's why in response to the changing market and the, some of the challenges that we face at the moment, um, we've reviewed and um, looked at our overarching business objectives and we've made sure that the financial elements have um, been maximised um, and we're looking at the performance of the existing business areas to ensure that we maintain that focus over the next five years. We need to remain sort of competitive. Um, we need to also um, look at the size of the opportunities um, and we need to transform our business um, both for our customers' experience, being as sustainable 
and um, championing that sort of reasonable, responsible business going forward. Interesting. And and the term, the term like agile finance has been pushed around over the course of the past couple of years, and it's become sort of almost almost synonymous with strategic financial management. And, and how do you think in your role that, that technology can help deliver agile finance and enable the finance role to elevate the role they play in a company's direction? So having the right tools um, are very powerful for a finance function. And so over the last few years, we've been very focused on developing and implementing a uh, business warehouse. Um, we have uh, we need to provide a very robust structure for our data so that the finance team can get the insights um, and have a single point of truth for them to be able to um, be efficient and be effective. We've worked really hard to ensure that um, we have other tools um, to enable and support the business planning, the forecasting um, and other sort of key functions of that financial business so that they can have that agile approach in how we look to the future and you know how, how we sort of plan for the next steps, particularly sort of under the current in environment and circumstances. Uh, and are you seeing like a shift in the way that the senior execs at Southern Co-op are embracing technology, um, particularly to deliver finance reporting? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, oh, about two years ago, um, I presented the BI strategy um, along with the technology roadmap to the leadership team. And, you know, they've been really supportive. They've absolutely bought into the um, investment and the changes that we needed to make to, um, you know, provide that robust infrastructure for the finance business. Um, and the finance director has actually sponsored a lot of these changes so that we can get that buy-in from the finance team because we have to make sure that you know what we deliver they're ready to accept and take on so that you get that sort of um, successful delivery so absolutely you know they've really bought into that and now um, I have a seat at the program board which on a regular basis we're presenting I'm presenting the um, the plan for supporting the finance business going forward and amongst other things, but absolutely for the finance team. And, and businesses like Southern Carp, you know, they continue to grow, but they could be struggling to effectively manage their financial planning on, on manual spreadsheets. So how much of an impact would, would not having technology as an enabler have on businesses growth and de delivering operational customer excellence oh a, a massive impact um you know the bit the, the finance teams the finance business wouldn't be able to make this sort of, um quick um informed decisions that they they currently are able to do with the technology um it would it would mean that the business would struggle to grow at the speed and pace that we need to to, to sort of compete in in the environment that we do and, um, and and the impact on the finance colleagues would be immense. Now, don't get me wrong, they, they still have spreadsheets and um, they use those on a regular basis, but they're more as a, an aid rather than the oracle of the data. You know, the technology now is, is the source for providing that single point of truth. Um, and then it's sort of supported by the, by the spreadsheets. I don't think we'll ever get rid of spreadsheets, but absolutely the technology now is leading the way in in making that um uh, enabling that informed decisions by those financial um teams and, and i guess as, as part of that as a discipline scenario planning has has developed significantly over the past few years and then of course we ha we had this sort of black swan event um in the form of the pandemic and and largely the rule book was thrown out so so how are southern co-op approaching scenario planning now and how has that changed from say two years ago so uh, from our perspective i would say our business continuity planning is very mature and um the the pandemic was something that we had actually or a pandemic was something that we had actually planned for and tested across the business 
So, you know, from a scenario planning perspective with the finance teams, as well as other areas of business, including myself from a technology um, perspective. But um, so we were prepared and we were able to implement the solutions and, and um, ways of working that enabled us to be um, on the front foot. Now, obviously, we're aware that the pandemic has been massively impactful. Um, and I think having that sort of preparedness enabled us to be able to work with it, continue to be agile and continue to make the decisions that the business needed. Um, because obviously we went in a completely different direction to, to where we had planned. Um, but yeah, I think we've been very fortunate that the governance um, and the leadership team were very um, keen to ensure that we had that scenario planning and, and business continuity plan in place um, for this eventuality. So it remained a very valuable tool. Um, oh, massive. Mm. Yeah, and, and, by, and by leveraging technology, what opportunities do you see there are for the finance function to become more, more accountable and forward facing to help their business to become, I guess, financially resilient in the future? Um, yeah, so the finance teams, I mean, they, they need to be spending their time analysing the data rather than gathering it. I think, you know, we've, the statistics say that they spend probably more proportionate amount of time gathering the data than they do actually, you know, um, making those sort of informed decisions from the um, calculation of the analytic. So um, we need to provide them um, with those opportunities for the streamlined processes so that they can, the data is available to them. And as I said before, it's that single point of truth. Um, we need to take, the systems need to take the heavy lifting out of those processes so that it, they, you know, get the information readily available and quickly. And um, we need to be able to make them sort of forward facing, that, that technology needs to be um, collaborative, collaborative, sorry, to improve performance and present new ways of working so that they get the insight for better decision making. Um, yeah. So I think I think there is the uh, they, we need to start really leveraging that technology. And and in your experience, uh, is is there an appetite for that in in the finance function? You know, to focus on their productivity, so more analysis can take place to drive the the business forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've certainly seen that appetite over the last couple of years, um, particularly with the investments that we have made and, and the changes that we've made with the systems. Um, but obviously, you know, the day to day operations and, and other areas of the business can take priority and therefore the focus does get detracted somewhat. But I think um, the finance function is becoming critical to the growth and operation of, of, or is critical to the growth and operation of any business. So we have to um, ensure that that focus is maintained um, and we have to try and bring it up the priority as, as you know, other things within the organization can deflect from it at times. Yeah, and, and then if we look at sort of things like financial integration, reporting and modeling is clearly on on the minds of finance professionals but um looking ahead how how, how prepared is companies such as southern co-op to start considering those capabilities in the ai space such as automation yeah so we've we've actually already dabbled in ai and automation um we ran a proof of concept over the summer last year we just focused on what on one or two processes where we felt that we would get some benefit and we really did see some positive um, opportunities coming forward to us. Um, I think with the, um, the, the, the merging technologies and tools available such as you know cloud, AI, there is um, a greater availability to deliver those benefits. And it's certainly something that we're starting to think about and starting to um, look at for the future. And do you think the the rise in tech capabilities for the finance function has has that changed the skill sets required of finance? Um, as with any innovation, uh, we have to all learn and adapt. Um, 
but I think I think there is that opportunity for the finance finance function with new tech capabilities to learn as they go along and to embrace them. Um, they they may need to adjust their til, uh, skill sets, but I think there is that um, appetite within the the finance functions to to sort of take that on board and um, really you know take the opportunity for these new skills that they'll be learning and and um, adapting the way that they work. And 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 then, how much does your business sort of rely on external data? And and how do you ensure you're looking at the right data to build scenarios and inform strategies? I know I know we, you touched on that before about how to use data, but be really interesting to get that point of view. So um, we do we use external data uh, across the business in in many of our business areas, um, and as part of our BI strategy. Um, we have an aspiration or we have an aspiration to create a platform um, for all of the business analytical data to be presented from. So, um, and, and we think that this will allow the, the business to essentially have the right data at the right time presented in, in a very familiar and standard format. Um, and, and from that, you know, they will have the opportunity to then really robustly create those scenarios and have that information to inform those strategies going forward. Um, it's a long-term objective and it's, it's a journey that we started a couple of years ago. So we, we're sort of focusing on the priority data and um, we're making slow progress, but I think you know, the business has really bought into that strategy and, and the finance team really can see the benefit that in the future, they will have all of the information, all of the data um, in, in one location. Um, and as I said before, one source, one source of the truth. So, so we're coming to the end of this discussion now, uh, Sam. And and over the re over recent years, you know, other organisation functions such as marketing and the supply chain, you know, they've had the spotlight on them um, to focus on growth and operational efficiency. However, how critical do you see the finance function and the and the finance leaders within within their companies? as crucial for the success of a business moving forward? Oh, massively. Um, I mean, finance has always been and will always be a critical function in any business. But going forward, the focus has to be on providing them with the, the right tools, the right software, the right system, the right solutions for them to be efficient, to be productive, um, and, and even more so because of what's happened in the last 12 months. Um, I think, and, and with the advent of AI and automation, the focus will be on those tools to provide that productivity and, um, and you know, ensure that those areas of the business and those leaders within those areas of the business can be productive. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I truly believe that that's coming their way very much. Well, it's been fantastic listening to you today. Um, thank you so much for your time, Sam. No worries, Tom. Thanks very much. Thank you. Right. Well, Tom, how, I mean, what, what, what did you think of that? I mean, it's fascinating listening to it. I've got a few comments I'd love to make, but just because you had that chance to have a chat with Sam, what, what, was, your, what was your sort of sound bites that came out from that that you sort of reflected upon? Yeah, it, it was it was great to hear from from Sam. She was she was really interesting. Um, I think I think the thing that that came up a few times there, um, and and I've heard as well in, when I'm doing uh, interviewing other people, um, was was about the value of data. Um, and we spoke about you know that that survey at the start showing that people are still in the early stages, and maybe this is a question for people when you get. A bit further on with your digital transformation thing is you've got so much data what do you do with it um, and that is a big question because because you can have so much because you have so much data it's like it's like in politics um, you can you hear politicians spout off stats at each other to show why they've done something and that they're good and then the other side will use those exact same stats slightly changed to say no this is it this explains exactly why i'm i'm doing it right and mm. 
and and it's the same it's the same here you you have to have that like she said the single source of truth the single version of the truth because otherwise you're sort of you're stuck you've got so many voices so many opinions and 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 sources of truth that it's very difficult to actually act on them so when you get that data and make sure that it all works it's all aligned to a common goal and that single singularity of choice and of, of truth that seems to be really key to me yeah uh, and uh, here at sempra we always talk about the intelligent use of data because i think we've gone past the fact of you know too much data big data we're now talking to a lot of our customers about the intelligent use of data which is kind of what you've picked up on there yeah. The other thing that the other thing that Sam said that was interesting was that they were able to prepare for the pandemic, which was quite interesting. And I think you had a just a quick story about the pandemic in terms of insurance. You told me last week. Just just comment on that quickly because we haven't got a lot. Of time. So it's fascinating. Um, I think the only other the only other company I had heard of that had um, successfully done uh, successfully prepared for the pandemic. Was, uh, was Wimbledon, the tennis championships, they had pandemic insurance. So while all these other sporting events were, were panicking the uh, lost revenue, which we'll see for, for months um, and years maybe, Wimbledon is like, nope, we'll, we'll stop for a year, no, bo- no bother, we'll just cash in that pandemic insurance that we've had for years. And, and I wonder, Southern were the only other ones. Well, I wonder, I wonder what they knew, but you know, that was, that was great preparation from them. Um, just a couple of things that I picked up on, uh, I just want to sort of share share with the listeners is, now Southern Co-op's 145 years old. I mean, I didn't realise they were that old as a company, so they've been really established for a long time. Sam did talk about the single source of truth. That was the one thing that she kept referring back to. I love the fact that she talked about um, CFO sponsorship. So the way that they were able to get the digital transformation and the investment was because the CFO was sponsoring the program. And also Sam was sitting on the program board as well. As well. So she was having that influence. Um, she also mentioned that Southern co would not be able to make quick decisions or grow their company if they were still operating off manual spreadsheets. So recognizing that the speed of the way that they had to adapt, uh, how they needed to grow, they couldn't do that on manual spreadsheets. Having the right tech in place was absolutely critical. She didn't say that spreadsheets would, would ever remove itself from the organization, but she would see that spreadsheets would be used as an aid, but not as the oracle, um, and still focused on the single source of truth. She talked about scenario planning. So she really did say we were able to plan for a pandemic. So they had that capability in place to be able to do that. I I love the fact that she talked about, you know, the finance leaders and the the people working in finance, spending less time on gathering data, focusing their streamlining, streamlining their um, processes, focusing on analytics. Their finance people uh, embracing new technology, learning and adapting, having an appetite to learn. And then the last couple of points was was finance in the spotlight. You asked a question about that. And she talked about the fact that finance leaders and the function itself needs the right tools, the right solutions and the systems in place to make them more productive. And the last point that I pulled out of here, which leads us very nicely on to the next next speaker, she talked about productivity they'd have dabbled in ai uh, using productivity tools to focus on uh, much more value added tasks they've done some sort of proof of value and they've seen some positive results which leads us on really nicely to our next uh, speaker and the next part of the agenda now this is ken mertzel from automation anywhere now if you have not heard of automation anywhere They are a leader in robotic process automation in the AI technology space, also known as RPA. Um, They build solutions to help finance organizations improve productivity and to lower operating costs. Now, 
I could have asked Ken to get up at four o'clock in the morning and join us. Uh, he's based in the US. I decided to be kind enough to, to ask him to, to also record his messages for our webinar today. But before I introduce um, and, and let's listen to what Ken's got to say, Ken Mertzel brings 25 years of experience in finance. Um, he's previously served as a CFO of the Insurance Group at Bank of America, uh, as well as management positions in Accenture, Progressive Insurance, and Bain and Company. So let's listen to what he's got to say about automation and productivity in the finance function. And then when we come back, Tom, we'll have a little natter again about what we thought. Hi, I'm Ken Mertzel, Global Industry Leader for Financial Services at Automation Anywhere. I can relate to the journey that most of you are going through since I've spent my entire career in finance. Prior to joining Automation Anywhere two and a half years ago, I spent 15 years at Bank of America, half of that as CFO of the insurance group, and then most recently worked for the chief accounting officer where I managed financial operations and also helped to implement the first proof of concept of RPA in finance. Prior to that, I was in the Accenture's financial services strategy practice, and before that at Progressive Insurance and Finance. Uh, so I know today you've been talking about how finance leaders can spend more of their time on analysis. And what I wanted to do in the next 20 minutes is talk about how intelligent automation is enabling organizations to make that happen. Before doing so, for those of you that aren't familiar with Automation Anywhere, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our company. We are the global leader in robotic process automation. Uh, but I know when I was in industry, uh, lots of vendors came to us all claiming to be number one. So don't take my word for it. Uh, take a look at uh, many of these research studies conducted by third-party analysts uh, who follow the RPA industry for more information. In terms of the statistics you see here, I think the ones that really stand out the most to me uh, certainly our, our global presence with uh, you know, over 4,000 customers across the world. But in addition, you can see, you know, we could arguably say that we're one of the largest digital employers in the world with over 2.6 million bots deployed. Uh, before I talk about uh, further about automation and RPA, I wanted to make sure that everyone's familiar with what RPA is. Uh, RPA is simply productivity software that sits on top of existing systems and performs a lot of manual, repetitive, um, often data-intensive processes traditionally performed by individuals. Um, the example I last often like to give is think about a Excel macro, but on steroids. So if you're an invoice processor and every day you go into your system, enter your ID, download some information, create a report, upload that back into the system and send an email to your supervisor letting you know that that task done, the RPA bots can do exactly the same thing at the click step level. So it can uh, create emails, et cetera. Um, and I think the key to the technology is the fact that it's very easier to use. It's, it's uh, basically drag and drop technology uh, and very quick to implement. Um, so if, if you think about the various tasks that you might do that are very repetitive day in and day out, if you see any of these types of activities, those are probably lend themselves very well to RPA. So as I mentioned, uh, sending emails, actually opening emails and extracting attachments and data from those attachments, doing any type of copying and pasting, filling in forms, moving data from one database to another, all of those tasks lend themselves well towards RPA. Uh, so often when we think about where technology is going, we don't think about RPA standalone, but we think about it more from a standpoint of an entire overall digital workforce. And there are really four key capabilities you need to implement a digital workforce. So first of all, you certainly need to determine where automation should be applied. And so for example, within our platform, we have something called Discovery Bot, which helps you determine which processes might, might be best for automation. So you can use that to actually map out processes, uh, design the process you want to automate, and actually leveraging the reporters actually be able to create an automation. Secondly, um, you need to capture data, and often that data is sitting in, in un unstructured or semi-structured forms in, in PDF files or emails. And so another key element, for example, within our platform is IQBot, 
where you can use advanced technology to actually extract that information from those documents and be able to leverage that then for uh, further RPA automation. And so this technology typically leverages behind the scenes sophisticated things such as machine learning and computer vision to really increase the throughput rate over historical OCR technology. The third key component, which we'll be talking a lot about today, is RPA itself. And that really comes in two flavors. Uh, historically, companies have used unattended automation, meaning you, you run a bot, it runs in the background, does its thing, and then you come back to it afterwards. Or um, the current trends and future trends are really around attended automation. So that's where you're actually able to utilize a bot in real time while you're interacting perhaps with a customer or a colleague um, and leverage that to pull all the information you need in real time and, and perform tasks while you're performing, uh, you know, while you're in discussions with, with customers or coworkers. And then lastly, it's really important to have uh, analytical capabilities. Um, so built, for example, into the platform is, is something we call Bot Insights. So basically smart analytics not only gives you information in terms of how the bots are performing, but more importantly, given all the data flowing the system, it can actually give you real-time dashboards to give you insights on your business itself. So next I wanna talk about how this technology is being applied in finance. And finance actually is the largest user of, of RPA globally. In fact, 27% of all our RPA software license revenues is focused on the finance and accounting function. And I think the reason for that, as you all probably know, um, finance leaders are facing a lot of challenges, particularly in the current environment. You know, with the pandemic, uh, all companies really have been facing some type of macroeconomic pressure, and therefore finance and all other operations are really been focused on business continuity and finding ways to continue to grow their business. In addition, given these pressures, there's been even more focus around liquidity and capital adequacy. So leveraging the technology to uh, improve and, and determine current status of cash flow. In addition, finance and really the entire company has always been focused on expense management. And I think that's even more case today. Uh, and so these technologies are being leveraged to really help transform operations. In addition, finance is heavily focused around risk and compliance. Uh, very important, obviously, that they're complying with all regulatory and accounting standards. And then lastly, finance is always uh, under pressure to um, strengthen governance and ensure timely and accurate reporting. So with that, let's see how RPA can be applied to, to meet those challenges. Um, first of all, when organizations start using RPA, in fact, it's often the finance organization bringing the technology in-house. Um, certainly the initial focus is around operational efficiency. So how can you streamline processes and reduce costs? But I think finance in particular recognizes significant additional benefits result from RPA. So first of all, we talked about the importance of timeliness. And RPA has really helped to accelerate the financial close uh, by streamlining operations and really providing more timely information for the business. In addition, I've seen many organizations that are, you know, their number one goal is really to use RPA to strengthen governance, um, replace manual controls, and tighten them to ensure, you know, accuracy and regulatory compliance. In addition, RPA is often leveraged to really foster innovation and use it as the platform to then expand into additional intelligent automation capabilities. And then lastly, um, organizations really are, are leveraging RPA to empower human capital. As you were all talking about earlier, um, the real focus is to automate a lot of those repetitive activities and then enable people to spend more time on true value added analysis. Um, one of the most common questions I'm asked is where can, you know, where should I start? Where can RPA be applied in, in finance and accounting? So I won't go through all of these, but these are typical use cases that we see across the finance organization. So starting on the left in procure to pay or accounts payable, it's probably the most common area of focus for RPA. And, and I think that's because that function uh, is so again, data intensive and manual intensive. And so um, if you look at accounts payable, probably the most common area of focus is around invoice validation. So as invoices come in from vendors, being able to extract the data from those invoices, um, match that then to goods receipts, um, 
match it to the purchase order so you can validate it and then process that for payment. That's a very common use case. Um, similarly, order to cash is a close second, so within the accounts receivable area. So whether that's for setting up new customers, uh, creating invoices, or uh, often increasingly being used to support the collections activities. And then thirdly, in record to report, it's, it's being used across the board. I, I'd say first and foremost within financial operations. So uh, assisting with the general ledger close, particularly around um, automating manual reconciliations as well as manual journal entries. In addition, there's increased focus lately around treasury operations. So I mentioned the importance of, of cash and understanding your cash position. And so RPA is being used to consolidate information from across different banks and then be able to create a consolidated uh, cash position report in real time. Uh, in addition, we're seeing a lot of interest in tax operations. Uh, it tends to be more focused around um, provisioning tax data or, or creating filings, less so around tax accounting itself. And then lastly, while there's a lot of applicability in financial planning and analysis um, to create uh, budgeting and forecasting and variance analysis, um, you know, it can also be leveraged to uh, assist with management reporting. But often organizations will start in sort of the left side of the chart uh, because you're looking for sort of areas where there's higher frequency, um, more manual activity and bigger opportunities for scale. Uh, I mentioned about accounts payable, and so specifically in that area, um, typically where we see um, you know, customers benefiting are, are certainly in terms of reducing the cost for invoice uh, and processing those invoices, but um, you know, equally important air, uh, benefits are around you know, eliminating processing errors because you're avoiding that manual keying, um, avoiding late payments, and, and maintaining good relationships with your vendors and suppliers. And then lastly, you know, real key is really freeing up capacity. So capacity of your employees for spending a lot of time in that manual entry, and again, can spend more time on really those much more complex invoices and analyzing how those should be handled. Uh, I wanted to give you one case study example here, and this is Australia Post, so the postal service in, in, uh, in Australia. And um, they really want to do two things. So one is certainly um, handle the huge volume of back office processes that they've had to maintain within finance, but also um, you know free up their employees to focus on much more strategic work. And so what they did is they sent up a set of excellence. They educated across the organization um, what RPA is and how it could be applied, and then identified uh, processes across the finance function uh, where uh, RPA could be used. And um, where they are now is they have over 25 processes automated, um, leveraging about 120 bots. And they're using it across a variety of processes, including, um, you know, again, um, booking financial journal entries, uh, managing um, credit and booking credit entries to process customer payments, and also managing in terms of uh, in inventory management. And you can see significant benefits. So they freed up over 18,000 hours annually. And again, that, that time can then be used more strategically by their employees and also reduce costs by over 15%. Um, so next, I want to talk a little bit about where we see the future of finance going. And, and I think the real key in the future is you're going to see much heavily more heavy use of intelligent automation. So marrying robotic process automation with other AI technologies to enable finance organizations to do a lot more strategic work. So, you know, here are four examples. So first of all, uh, moving from the focus around the month end or quarter end close to more of an instantaneous close by leveraging sort of real time and automated journal entries. Um, second, I think for all of you that have been involved in the budgeting and forecasting process, you know that that's very time intensive, very manual effort, takes a long time across an organization to create a budget or a forecast. And I think where we see things moving is much more towards uh, real-time budgeting and real-time forecasting, again, leveraging these technologies and leveraging bots to uh, enable collaboration and real-time analysis. Uh, the third area of opportunity we see is around uh, really enabling the business to do their own self-service reporting and analysis. So rather than leveraging the finance team to create you know, management reports for them, being able to do that on their own. 
in the last area where we see intelligent automation being applied is really ultimately to eliminate you know nearly all manual data entry and report preparation and again the key to this is to enable finance professionals again who are highly trained and highly capable to then focus on creating business insights and, and advanced analytics one tool that we see um, to enable this in the future is around uh, providing finance employees ultimately with their own digital assistant. So just how today nearly all finance employees leverage Excel macros, I see not too far off in the future where all employees will have their own digital assistant bot. Um, you know, one example you've seen is, is for example, we just rolled out a product called Ari or uh, Automation Anywhere Robotic Interface. And again, that enables uh, all employees to have their own digital assistant, just how you know people in their personal lives use Siri or Alexa. And again, you can see that'll be be able to be leveraged across any type of platform, you know, mobile, apps, web, et cetera. Um, so lastly, I want to spend a little time talking about um, what are the, we seeing as the key steps to successful implementation of these, these technologies? And I think the first thing, and I mentioned that it was one of the first steps they did at, at Australia Post, is selecting the right processes. So again, you want to focus on those processes that are you know, manual, repetitive, data intensive. Um, you don't necessarily need to automate an entire end-to-end -end process, uh, but you want to pick those parts of the processes that maybe are, are sort of acting as barriers to efficiency. Um, and automate those. Um, they certainly need to be rules-based. If they require a significant amount of human judgment, um, maybe you'll just automate those initial portions of the processes, and then people can jump in to then carry the process from there. Um, and you certainly want very strong business sponsorship for those processes you've selected, um, since you really are gonna need to leverage the time of individuals in the operations who are very knowledgeable about that process, and so you're gonna need business support. Second, we recommend that our, our customers um, start small and scale fast. Again, this is a very common concept in, um, in innovation. So start, you want to do a proof of concept. So get the organization comfortable with RPA. Again, you're not so much proving the technology, the technology is mature, but uh, you know, getting a quick win early on, um, creating perhaps a demo that you can show others in terms of how it works. And then after that, then quickly identify opportunities for scale. So again, look for those areas where you have high volume, high frequency, you know, very time intensive activities. And then lastly, um, the key is really to organize for success. So um, you wanna start off maybe creating a small center of excellence with some key skill sets. So obviously knowledge of RPA, um, having some technical capabilities. Again, the good news about, about RPA is you don't need to be you know, an IT professional to actually create a bot. Uh, very much drag and drop. Typically, um, bots can be created in a matter of eight to 12 weeks. The, the actual coding itself can be done in a matter of, of days. It's more of the process design that's key. Uh, but you certainly need people within your, your center organization who are familiar with the technology. And probably the most key skill is around program and change management to manage your overall automation efforts. And in addition, we, we strongly recommend that you um, create sort of a federated organization. What we mean by that is that in addition to your strong, you know, central center of excellence, you then want to appoint automation leads in each of the different areas within your finance organization or across your company as a whole. Again, individuals have been, you know, educated in what RPA is. Um, what types of opportunities would work for automation, and then help them work with the, the businesses themselves to help prioritize those opportunities, even do some of the initial design, and then the actual coding can be done either in the business units or, or centrally with the, uh, the centers of excellence. So I, th I think those are really um, three key uh, elements to getting off to a, a strong start in RPA. So with that, um, I wish you a lot of success in your RPA journey, and I appreciate your attention and hope you all have a great day. Well, Tom, um, I didn't get to do a fireside chat with Ken, but I did get a chance to be involved in his recording and his messages that he, that he obviously conveyed to us today. Um, I thought it was fascinating in terms of the key messages that he talked about. I made a few comments. So before I ask for your sort of thoughts around Ken's, Ken's presentation, a couple of things that came out of Ken's I thought was interesting. First of all, 
think about RPA as Excel macro on steroids. That was his way of opening up and describing what RPA can be seen as, as a, as a capability. Talked about easy to use drag and drop functionality. So this is something that doesn't need huge high skill levels to be able to use. Talked about the fact that the largest user of this type of automation capability is the finance function. 27% of all of their automation processes happen to take place in the finance function. So it really is the finance function in this instance that's leading the way in terms of AI and automation. He talked about what bots can do for finance leaders. I think one of the questions I'm looking at that came through was asking what, what kind of uses in uh, finance can AI uh, be used for? I'm hoping that question's been answered by Ken uh, through that presentation. Um, really looking at taking away those heavy manual lifting tasks. How to leverage a digital workforce alongside your actual role yourself and how that can increase operational efficiency and start to empower the people that work in the finance function to focus on those value added tasks. Uh, the use cases were very much around procure to pay, order to cash, record to report, and there was a number of different processes underneath all of those three, those three uh, pillars. The benefits were talked about, which was reducing costs, Eliminating process errors. Who doesn't want to eliminate process errors? The fact that the automation can actually be that compliant to actually completing those tasks is absolutely critical. And then he talked about the future and he talked about the fact that he sees the finance function eliminating, you know, finance people having to do that manual data entry, that report preparation and giving those finance leaders the opportunity to focus on more business insight activities. And then finally, there was another question that came in on the panel that I've been tracking. It was talking about where to start in terms of digital transformation. And what's nice is he talked about three tips to get started. First of all, select the right processes. Those processes that are, are very much um, embedded inside your business, those processes that are heavy, manual, repetitive tasks. Think about those processes first of all. Start small and then you can scale. And then organize yourself for success. Talked about change management and having people along the journey with this. So again, I thought it was a fantastic message for the, for the listeners today. Um, Tom, before we go into the final Q&A, what was your thoughts of what Ken had to say? Yeah, but uh, really interesting to hear from Ken. I mean, first of all, you think you just think, wow, what a CB. Um, but um, yeah, like like I've just got just got two two brief points really. Um, so like you, I looked, I saw that twenty seven percent of the finance function. I thought that was really interesting, and he's saying, you know, pressure is on for finance. Um, but what it also showed to me is that if you're not using tech, well, your your competition is, um, yeah. and there's often this question about, will automation take my job? And I, and I wonder if you might think about it differently than that and sort of say, well, maybe it won't take your job, but maybe if your company and your corporation is not using these sorts of innovations, it'll take your business and, and, and the competition will catch up on you. And, and it's one of those things where you start thinking, we have to keep doing this. Um, and and then, you know, the other point really that the time saver element of this, um, yeah. it 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 brings a new question of well, what on earth does a future finance leader look like? And mm. and that to me is really exciting because it's not about taking your job; it's about looking at how you can use that time that you've saved to do to do better things with your time but yeah and and the digital assistant bot that sounds frightening but really cool well I, i've got a feeling based on the your your kind of comments there that i know what your next blog's going to be about tom by the sounds <laughs> of, of what you've heard about today from ken so let let's finish off this webinar with the q a now as i say the questions that have come in have actually been answered by they were asked before the, 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 the messages were conveyed. So as I say, we've, I think we've captured and answered quite a few of those questions. But there's a couple of other that came in 
before the webinar. One of them was about, you mentioned it, Tom, you know, should finance employees view RPA as a threat to their role? Now, I had the chance to ask Ken this. I, I didn't want to sort of take this answer myself. So I said, Ken, what, what, what's your typical answer? I'm sure you get asked this many, many times. He talked about, um, obviously, finance employees, understandably, a little bit concerned about the intelligent automation moving its way into their business. Um, but he talked about um, rather than thinking about the technology as a threat, more about how it will, how it will replace some of those manual sort of tasks. So he gave a bit of an example. He said, think about the invention of the laptop. Um, at the time, uh, many years ago, those that were still working when the invention of the laptop came in, uh, it was seen as a threat to the workers. Uh, now it's just seen as a very powerful tool that is a tool that allows you to do your job more effectively. That is only the only way that we're going to see RPA in naturally coming into an organization. It will mean that those people, unless there's people out there that enjoy doing manual, repetitive data entry tasks, they will be the ones that, that will be moved into automation. But it is going to shift the finance leaders to be able to do much more of that business value-added value strategic analytical tasks. Um, Tom, do you have a, a point on that? Should finance employees view RPA as a threat to their role? Yeah, I mean, wh when I talk to CFOs and finance leaders, they, they all say the same thing. And, and that is technology such as RPA is an enabler. And that, and that, like they said, it means that you're not doing the mundane manual tasks and processes that, that generally you would say is not a good use of your time. Um, but that in turn should then free up time for you to be doing the analysis and you know that that value add that we we often talk about that the RPA can't provide. Um, but yeah, like you said, if if perhaps you're the sort of person that likes doing your mundane manual tasks, then then yeah, it might take your job. But I don't think many people want to be doing those things. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Right, I mustn't forget, we have, we asked the listeners to contribute towards the poll. Uh, why don't we have a look at the results of that and see how it compared to your survey back in October, Tom? So I don't know if the guys can put this up on the screen. Yes. Okay. Right, this is great because it's different. I think it's different to what we saw back in October. So Tom, up to date was 6% in your last survey. People on, people on the, the poll today, nobody is up to date with their digital transformation. Uh, when it comes to nearly complete, 14% uh, last time, we're at 18% here. Halfway was 27%. Oh, I've lost the poll. Uh, can we put it back? Oh, yeah. Halfway, 32% on the poll, 27% was back in October. Early stages, October was 47%. We're at 36% here and not started. 14% of the people on the webinar today haven't started. That compares to 6% back in October. Um, any quick comments? I mean, the, you know, they're rel 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 roughly the same, Tom, but, but yeah, um, any quick comments? Yeah, I guess obviously you'd be worried about the 14%, but I think it's, you know, people are still, they're still sort of, the, the rest are starting to move along that way, you know, on, on the on the scale. Um, I think having none up to date, I think that's just realistic. Um, yeah. That, yeah. That, you're, that, you know, maybe the technology that you're going to be using in a couple of years time, it doesn't exist yet. So yeah. on that, level, it might just be being realistic. Um, yeah. Good to see that more are in the halfway and more are getting pushed out of the early stages um yeah. but but for those who haven't started it's like yeah let's get a move on now yeah no that's good well listen thank you listeners for basically contributing to that because that gives you another data point tom based on three yes. four months later from october as well um last couple of questions um technology is only enabler let's not forget that right let's not forget that what we've seen today what we've heard about today is Digital transformation needs technology to digitize, to transform an organization. We know that. But what about the people? How do you bring them on the transformation journey? So I have a view on this. There's three, three things when this question came in. First of all, you mustn't forget the change management of bringing the people along. I'm sure people that are listening on this webinar have seen 
their business transform. And, and it is all about bringing people along that journey. That means investing in them so they're comfortable with using the technology. So if you're gonna introduce something like a business planning solution, or you're gonna introduce an RPA solution, it's about making sure that you invest in the people so they're comfortable with using that technology. The second point is um, the data literacy. So the data that's behind the technology that's embedded into the technology, making sure that people that are using that te technology are comfortable with being data literate. They're, they're, they're comfortable with the data that they're seeing that they're needing to act upon. And then the third one, I have to go back to what Sam Bradshaw said, which was about leadership uh, and sponsorship. So if you're gonna do this digital transformation, uh, you're going to need that sponsorship for it to be successful. Sam talked about she had the CFO that was was sponsoring the digital transformation in co-op. Tom, do you have a comment? Yeah, um, very, very similar to you, Paul. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's not about taking your job. Um, and, and I think you have, to, I think when we talk about investing, um, investing in tech, we often think about the cost, the cost of investing in technology. Um, but yeah. maybe... But maybe when we talk about investing in people, it's about time um, mm. and investing your time as a leader into your team and, and saying that the, that it's not that showing them how to use it. And like you say, showing them why it's valuable, because it's a relationship between your staff and 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 the technology that you have. If, if both aren't nurtured, it's not going to work. It doesn't just solve all your problems because you've got the latest tech. Um, yeah. You have to know how to what to do with it. Absolutely, right. Well, look, Tom. I'm going to take this last question that came in uh, when it when somebody registered uh, for the webinar, and then we're going to wrap up. So, how can solutions we've heard about today improve forecasting processes? So I think Sam talked about the fact that as part of their digital transformation, they've got themselves off manual spreadsheets into a business planning solution. That allows you to be able to connect all of your business up into one single view. She talked about single source of truth. That allowed Southern Co-op to do what if or scenario planning so that if they needed to adapt or adjust their business based on what we've all seen happen in the last 12 months, they can do it quickly and efficiently. The forecasting side, if you look at any leading business planning solution on the market today, the leading technology solutions, they all have AI capability embedded into their solutions today. So that absolutely helps an organization not only record what is happening today, but also be able to do that prediction and that forward thinking in terms of that forecasting. And that AI capability allows that to happen. So if you look at the leading business planning solutions out there, they all have this AI embedded into their solution. That's only going to improve your forecasting in terms of your processes. Right. OK, I'm going to do some thank yous and close this out. So first of all, Tom, thank you for joining me on this webinar. It's been an absolute pleasure getting to know you and having you as part of this. So I thank you for attending and giving your comments. Um, I also want to thank Sam Bradshaw and Ken Mertzel for contributing to today. Um, please do visit SempraAnalytics.com in a, in a very short while to access the on-demand of the webinar. We will be following up with all of you um, and sharing the collateral that was uh, shared today. And uh, with that, I think um, all I need to say now is have a great rest of your day and um, thank you very much for attending. <laughs>